Alright, I'm going to turn it over to Douglas. Okay. He has the stage. Oh, well, in the center you see that uh, those pearls are from the strand called Bohem that appeared in the, in the book uh, Pearls by Hubert Barry and David Lamb. And today we're going to talk about pearls and how they can benefit the environment. So, the first thing is, many of you already know this, but Mexico was the world's main producer of pearls for only 380 years. Mm -hmm. Only. only. Uh -huh. <laughs> Some people, depending on the sources, will tell you 480. Others will just say uh, 420. But anyway, for during 480 years, we had a continuous production of pearls throughout the entire uh, Sea of Cortez. And these, my pearls, can be considered the first real South Sea pearls. And why? Because when they discovered the Pacific Ocean, look, you see this map, it says Mare del Sur, <laughs> South Sea. <laughs> Every time I have a chance to tell it, especially to an Australian, it's ours are the first ones, you know? Yours were not discovered until a century later. <laughs> so, uh, Mexican pearls were the first South Seas. <clears throat> That's it. So the pearl fisheries in the Sea of Cortez or Gulf of California, basically we depended on slave labor. Mm -hmm. This is an old photograph of the Yaqui Indians. Mm -hmm. So these were the people that made it possible for the Spaniards to get the pearls. Because I don't know if you know this, but uh, Spanish people are not very known for being good divers. Swimmers, have you ever seen the Olympics? <laughs> have you ever heard of a Spanish athlete, swimmer? No? You're usually in the 500 place position. So the Spanish had to resort to getting the natives, the real people that were diving for the pearls. And these were the Yaquis from the area where we live in Guaymas. And the pearl beds were so abundant. I mean, the Spanish wrote that there were leagues and leagues of pearl beds. So when the Yaquis went down, they didn't come with one oyster. In the two, three minutes they spent under water, they would come up with hundreds at a time. And there were some people that would even fish thousands at a time. So in, the in 1940, no more pearl fishers in the Sea of Cortez. That's how long they lasted. So two years after the conquest of Mexico City until 1940. And the oysters that we have in this American continent, we actually have four species in Mexico. Two on the Pacific side and two on the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean side. So we have the pintadas, and here to the left you see pintada mazatlanica. This is our black lip. <coughs> so it was once considered to be uh, margaritifera mazatlanica, but then they came up with this idea that it's a distinctive species. So it's native to our area. And you can find it from the Gulf of California all the way down to Costa Rica. It's a big oyster. It can grow to 20 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Not as big as the black lip, the kumingi from uh, Tahiti, but big enough. Mm -hmm. And the other one is this little one that you even have here in the United States. You can find it in Florida if you go looking for it. And it can be found all the way down to Brazil. But this pearl oyster, which is Pintara imbricata, is tiny. The biggest ones uh, in the wild that I've seen are this big. And these uh, imbricatas were the ones responsible for the pearl fisheries in Isla Margarita in Venezuela. So those were the ones that Christopher Columbus was taking out. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we also have two species of terias. Uh. <laughs> so terias are different from pintadas. They belong to the same family, Teridae, but anatomically, you can see how different they are. The shell is thinner, and they have this wing or projection. So on the top uh, uh, photo, we have Teria sterna, which is the one we have in the Sea of Cortez, and it has been found to be invasive in the United States, in Southern California sometimes, when there's a Nino year. So this is a Nino year, so maybe next year, you go into the water, you'll see some terias. Thinking, Josh is thinking, hmm, hmm, hmm. <laughs> get some, see them. 
And the other species is Teria colimbus, which you can find also in the United States, from North Carolina all the way down to Brazil. And of course, the species is also small. Mm -hmm. So, of these four species in the Americas, the two that are considered to be more important because of their size and their beauty are the ones on the Pacific side. Mm -hmm. So we have those two species. Now, what caused the pearl beds to disappear in the Sea of Cortez? Many causes. It wasn't just one thing. The first cause, overfishing. I mean, if you have to fish 10,000 oysters in order to find just one pearl, <coughs> And when you see the portraits of the kings, queens, the noblemen and noble women of Europe, I mean, decked with pearls, from their wigs down to their toes. <laughs> you can imagine they needed a lot of oysters. So it was like committing a genocide. So millions over millions were fished out. But then we also had natural environmental changes. Like a Nino year, a Nina year, those can also affect the pearl. Uh, oysters. Someone proposed in 1935 that there was a disease going on. But there was something really important that happened in 1939. It was Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. So it was built and the water that used to flow into the Sea of Cortez did not flow anymore. Mm -hmm. So what happened? At that moment, the water temperature started rising. Uh, oxygen levels went down. Salinity went up. And all the, uh, the fresh water from the Colorado brought minerals into the Sea of Cortez <coughs> that were used by the local uh, phytoplankton, the microscopic algae. So if you stop that water flowing, it changes the environment. So it was like dropping a bomb. Boom. And that's the moment when two species of uh, animals disappeared from the Sea of Cortez. And they, people noticed this because it, it was an important industry, the pearl industry. And the other one was there was this fish that we had this tall mm -hmm, called totuaba. And it, it needs fresh water in order to breed. So no fresh water, no breeding, disappearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we believe it was uh, Hoover Dam, the last nail in the coffin. But in those days, no one spoke about uh, ecology or really understood anything. So it's not uh, something that people wanted to happen. It just happened. Okay. So once again, we have pearls coming from the Sea of Cortez after, let's say, 80 years. Uh, we also have natural pearls. Why? Because we have been able of helping recoup the natural pearl beds. So two years, since two years ago, we've been told by uh, gemological labs, especially in Europe, that they're seeing strands and strands of new Cortez pearls coming in into the labs for certification. So that can only mean that the fisheries have come back again. They have, we know that for a fact. And we're, only, we're the only marine pearl farm, commercial one, in the Americas right now. So well, this is a little bit about our operation. Okay, so we're using exclusively the Teria sterna, the rainbow lip, pearl oyster. We have like 200,000 oysters in the farm, so it's not a huge farm, it's a medium sized one. We have around 15 employees working at the farm, and we have a very limited production of 1.2 to 3.8 kilos per year. That was my estimate but it was actually four kilos, so 200 more grams, mm -hmm. 200 more pearls. <laughs> wow. it, it's not much. I mean, it's the rarest culture pearl in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, this, uh, our pearl was also included in the Fair Trade Gems list. Uh, it's not a very official list, but at least uh, we're there, and that means that uh, we keep to treat uh, uh, very important um, uh, pillars that should, uh, the pearl industry should have in order to be sustainable. Okay. So for those of you that don't know much of what happened with us, how we came up with this idea to grow pearls, we started when, when uh, we were young. That's me, look. 
Still, still have the same coat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my dad's coat. Cowboy one. The leather. <laughs> and we started a team of uh, four people. Sergio Farel in the center. He was our, our teacher. Enrique Arismendi on the right. Uh -huh. Manuel Nava, who is here, still has hair in that photo. Uh -huh. <laughs> and myself. Uh -huh. So we were doing research about everything. We wanted to know everything about the pearl oysters from both species. How to culture them. Uh, how well they, uh, uh, they survive on sort of ha handling or uh, different culture uh, conditions, reproduction, growth rates, pearl culture, of course. That was an idea. But of course, we, in those days, we were told by our teacher, Sergio, that it was not possible to grow pearls from Teddy Esterna. Okay. He had read many articles, and some of the articles said that the Teria genus oysters cannot be used to grow beaded pearls. So we were only going to use them for mabe. Okay. This is uh, Campus Guaymas of Tecna Monterrey, when we were students back in those days. This is the area where we have the farm the dock, and our jewelry store is located up here. Mm -hmm. So it, you can see it was a big university, very nice, 600 students, all thinking about marine sciences, aquaculture, uh, dolphins, everything. This is a view of the farm in 1996, and you can see the water polo uh, area over there. <laughs> it was a school. <laughs> The real students and everything. There's the farm. Uh -huh. Lots of pelicans always. That's cool. So, 1993, a long time ago, we did the pearl oyster census. So the first thing we needed to know is how many oysters do we have here in this bay? So we did the census and it gave us back this information, 88 black lip pearl oysters in the entire bay. Wow. And 54 rainbow lips, that's it. All others had been fished out, killed, whatever. And one important thing is that they were all in isolation. You know, for these animals to breed properly, you need 10 animals in one square meter. Wow. That increases the chance of one sperm cell and an egg cell meeting and then having fertilization. So without that, it's impossible. Has anyone tried to create an artificial coral structure for mm -hmm. the food? You can, but under Mexican laws, it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a nightmare. Why don't you just tell them that it's okay? <laughs> <laughs> with, with politicians, doesn't work. <laughs> and if they say, is that okay? No, I'm going to change it. Just so it's not okay. Uh -huh. Never trust a politician. About how many uh, necklace strands are there of Cortez pearls now? I know in mm. Renee Newman's book that came out a couple of years ago, it uh -huh. says sp specifically that there were no necklaces. Oh yeah. So we knew that that is not true. Uh -huh, exactly. And so I was wondering what the count is approximately. It's now. like 14. No, I think, isn't it high, real higher? Well, of the really high-end strands? No, not just the real high-end. Okay. Well, high-end is good too. I mean, <laughs> it should be like around 38 right oh, now. Okay. Because there's also people that buy the loose pearls and start making right, the strands. Yeah, right? So we can't count those because no. we don't know about those. Right. Uh -huh. But uh, there are not many. They're still very rare. Right. So there's just a couple every year, right? That you make Last year we didn't come up with any. Oh. Yeah. So the one this That's year, why we the brown strand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have to get married how instead. Many, how many pearls do you get each year? And uh, last year we had uh, almost two kilos, less than 200. So 200 I, I mean, 2,000. 2000. It was 1,700 pearls. And this year we had 4,083. 
Does that include your mahogany or no? No. The mahogany. How many oysters do you have to, or how many? Uh, the idea is to every year have 100,000 oysters. So from those 100,000, you start having mortality rates. And then there are some oysters that will not be able to be operated because they don't grow that well. Um, and you end up using, let's say, between uh, 20 to 40,000 oysters. Mm -hmm. So from those is where we get the, all the pearls, including the mavic. Wow. And mm -hmm. so you tend the 20 to 40,000, that means you... Yeah, uh, Manuel was doing the math. He's really good with math this year. And he said that oh, only 4% of the oysters make a pearl. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, get into the calculation, the gem pearls, which are like 5% of all the harvest, you can imagine how difficult they are to yeah. get the really high-end ones. Mm -hmm. So you seeded 40,000? Yes. 40,000 beads to come mm -hmm. up with 4,000 pearls yeah. that you got this year. And what's the growing time? Two, two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. two years. So if we place an order now for your fantastic <laughs> pearls, we well, then have to wait two years. <laughs> and, um, so in two years, we have to have the savings account just for your pearls. <laughs> and and that's that's sort of. And even with that, I can't make a promise because uh, every year is different. Mm -hmm. For instance, this year, we've been told we're, we're going to have four hurricanes. Oh my and God. we barely outlived the last two hurricanes we, yeah. we encountered. So mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe this time we won't make it. Who knows? I'm counting on it.